Hi, welcome to Whiskey and Wool. My name is Shannon Bellum. I am coming to you from Northern New Jersey where I work and I live. Um, so I'm super close to New York City and yeah, I'm like in the bedroom state. Oh, we're in the bedroom state. Uh, what am I wearing? What am I wearing? I'm wearing the Ingrid cardigan, or sorry, not cardigan, pullover. The Ingrid pullover by Isabel Kramer. I've talked about it before. Um, I had made this to wear to EYF earlier this year. And yeah, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous day here. Um, it is actually in the 60s. Uh, well, I guess it's just 60 Fahrenheit. Um, unusually warm day, which we sometimes get still towards the end of November because of it's still officially, I think, hurricane season. So if a hurricane or any sort of tropical storm pushes warm clouds north or like a warm weather band north, we get warmer weather for a day or two. And then it's right back to freezing, <laughs> literally. Yeah, we've already had our first frost and everything is dead outside, but um, it's a beautiful sunny day, which I'm going to try to take advantage of right now while I talk to you today about whiskey and wool. <laughs> um, let me talk to you about what I'm drinking. I actually have a little treat for you because um, this was an unexpected uh, acquisition of mine. Um, I got a bottle from my sister who flew out of Ireland uh, earlier this month. This is called Glendalough. It's a single cask Irish whiskey. So instead of talking about scotch today, I'm going to talk to you about Irish whiskey instead. Um, if you don't know, if you're not an aficionado of whiskey, um, that E in there uh, Scotch whiskey does not have the E in, in whiskey, which is where I take I took my name from. I didn't put the E in. Um, I made it so that should, if someone is no, knowledgeable, they would know that when, I, when I'm talking about whiskey, normally I'm always talking about Scotch. However, I do drink other ones. Um, I like scotches because there's so many distilleries that just do single cask. So um, here in the States, a lot of our whiskeys like Dewar's and stuff like that are blended um, scotches, which give you a really consistent taste. But I kind of, I like the individuality that you get with um, single, a single malt. Um, a couple people asked me to discuss history of scotch and also... Uh, to talk about the process, I think, of the production of whiskey. So instead of talking about that, I'm going to link some really good videos, um, like as if I have guest speakers. This is what I tell my students when I give them videos to watch. I'm like, I invited a guest speaker today to go over this. So I'm just going to put some video links down in the description box in my um, show notes of uh, videos that I think do a pretty good job talking about the process of making whiskey and also... Um, the history of it. So that way I don't have to be the resident ex expert. Instead, I'm bringing experts in. Uh, okay, so Glendalo, let me just talk to you a little bit about this distillery. They are located in Wicklow County, or County Wicklow, as they say in Ireland, um, which is just south of, um, of Dublin. And it is known for its beautiful national parks and gorgeous countryside. Um, also, I believe there is still a bit of an ancient forest there. I think there's pockets of the ancient forest because Ireland used to be known as the Wooded Isle where they said that you a squirrel or even a person, I guess, could cross the entire island without ever putting their feet on the ground just by going from tree to tree to tree. So it's no longer like that. There's a lot. There's very few trees um, in Ireland, but there are some pockets of, of ancient wood. Um, and Wicklow, County Wicklow has, as I said, a pretty significantly sized um, national park. So here, I'm giving you a little other <laughs> tidbits of information. Um, okay, so let's get into the whiskey. So this particular one um, is, it's, it's a special one. So here, here's, a, here's a tip for whiskey connoisseurs. Um, if going through duty-free in these cities that um and areas that are known for producing 
any type of alcohol, whether it's wine or um, gin or vodka or uh, whiskeys or bourbons, um, th- will often yield some special bottles. So this is very definitely a special bottle of Irish whiskey. If I think you can see there, it says single cask. So there's, it was produced for, it says, for the Irish whiskey collection. So that was a particular collection, I guess, that was generated for, um, to like draw together a collection of Irish whiskeys for, you know, to make like a, a special gift um, purchase or like a, a collector's edition, right, of, of um, particular whiskeys. So it's, you can't buy this. Um, single bottle, a single bottle separate from the collection, except in weird places like duty free shops. <laughs> so, if you do like unique whiskeys, it's important to um, check out what's happening in those duty free shops. I'm not saying every single one will have will yield results, but many times you'll you know you might be happy with the surprises that you unearth in those little duty free shops. Um, so. Anyway, this is a single cask. It is um, as so all the Glendalo whiskeys start their life after the distillation process. They start their their aging in American oak um, that have been used in the bourbon industry. So um, our bourbon laws here in the U.S. only allow for a single use, a single aging use of bourbon in the American oak or whatever wood. Um, the barrels only get one shot and then they are um, purchased by whiskey distillers around the world and uh, utilized for that. So those um, American oak barrels will impart these flavors of honey and vanilla into the whiskey. So that's always sort of this baseline. You'll find that is like a baseline in almost all whiskeys. And there's also this idea that you get a little bit of sweetness from the bourbon. So the aging process, like to just give you a little bit of why I'm telling you all of this, the aging process in the barrels will impart a lot of flavor. Other things that will impart flavor to the whiskey, which I think is what is important, and this is probably what I think one of my viewers had sent me an email saying, you know, I'd like to know more about that. I think this is really what she was getting at. Um, water, the water used and the, the, the grain used will also impart some flavor and the distillation process. So um, every every distillery that you go to will have, may have, not every, but many will have unique shaped stills where they're cooking the the mash. And uh, that is said to give certain flavors as well. Um, So, but certainly a lot or most of the flavors will come from the aging process and what woods the whiskeys are put in. Um, So in this case, that's why I always talk about the wood, okay? So if you are curious, like why, why is she telling us what they were aged in? Um, that is why I'm telling you what they were aged in. So this began its life in the um, uh, American oak, bourbon soaked American oak, <laughs> which imparted vanilla and honey flavors. And it had its second life in um, in burgundy casks, which I think you can read there on the label. Yeah. So see this, it's second, it's finished, what they call a finishing age. So it might spend like 10 years in American oak and then two to five years in a different um, type of wood. So the the finishing was, I don't know, if, wait, I'm going to just read on the back because it said, uh, okay, so they, it spent its finishing in Grand Cru Burgundy casks. Um and what the burgundy casks do is impart a little bit of fruity, like red fruity flavors. So berries, right? Or like rich red grape taste. You know, that's what will impart into the uh, whiskey. So this particular one, I, I've got out my wee dram again. Um, I would say, wow. You really get strong, toasty butterscotch taste up front. Um, you can also see the color. It's a, uh, it's pr- fairly 
middle of the road in terms of whiskey colors. So it's um, actually, it's it, I would say it's even sort of a dark amber color, but in the glass, it looks a little paler. I did put my few drops of water in as I always do to sort of to make the flavors bloom. Um, but this, wow, this really tastes a lot like toffee and caramel and butterscotch flavors. I get the berry at the end. Actually, I kind of, I get the berry in the middle, like a strong berry, like raspberry. There's like a tartness that I think we can contribute to the, um, the burgundy barrels. So anyway, that is, that is your whiskey talk <laughs> for today. Um, I did, and you probably saw because I videotaped, I put a little clip in in the beginning of my, of what, how my Christmas tree looks today. Um, it's undecorated and I will be um, decorating it this week. So next time when you start, when Vlogmas starts, so Vlogmas starts on Sunday, you will see it decorated. Um, maybe even, I might film some of me decorating it. I think I'm going to decorate it on the weekend after um, Thanksgiving. Anyway, under my tree, you saw my advent calendars and my scotch whiskey advent calendar is here. So I will start opening that and then there will be a lot of whiskey chatter that is going to be scotch whiskey for a little while until you know, we get tired of that or I get a request from someone. Um, I really want to talk about Japanese whiskeys too because they're super interesting and I have a couple favorites um, in there. But anyway, we'll talk about that. Oh, I forgot to mention, I wanted to talk about the label. So see that man holding a crow or a blackbird and see the grapes on the, so the grapes, that's this, there, this um, distillery always has this guy. This is St. Kevin. So they always, this is their icon, the their branding icon, right? Um, but the label having the grapes is unique to this bottle. So the um, labels are generally plain on the back and they'll be different colors depending on which one of their, which whiskeys um, you purchase. So they have like, they have like a seven year, a 10 year, I think they have a 15 year, I think they have a 12 year. They've got a couple other special collector's editions. I mean, smart, smart guys. Um, it's a collection of friends, I think, that opened it. So anyway, St. Kevin is thought to have, or maybe perhaps known to have lived in a monastery in County Wicklow. And he was known to go out and pray with his arms up in the air, as you as you see here <laughs> on the label. Um, and supposedly he stood out in the water and prayed with his arms up in the air for so long that a, a blackbird came and laid her eggs in one hand. And so he stayed out there until the eggs hatched. So they say. The way of myth and legend, especially in Ireland. <laughs> anyway, okay. So that is that. That is the whiskey that I am sipping on today. Um, I also have tea, which I may sip on as well. Um, all right, let's get into it. I have an FO. This thing took forever. I, um, I finished my Birds of a Feather shawl. Oh, I have one little end to weave in that I, that I, I missed when I was doing my weaving in of ends. Let me see if I can <laughs> figure out. It is so long. Look at it. Look at it. Yeah, you're you're looking at the right side. I mean, I do love it. I don't know why I was so surprised it took me so long. Um, I'm going to just run it by you while I talk about it. Because it is about 1,200 yards of yarn. And I know a sweater... <laughs> For me, I need about 1,200 yards to knit a sweater. So then logic would have it that 1,200 yards of yarn takes you the same amount to knit no matter what you're making. So I should have realized that it was going to take me as long as knitting a sweater would take me. So, um, yeah. Oh, it took me so long. I really just wanted to get it done. Like from the moment that I got to here, this space right here, 
I just really wanted to get it done um, because I could. I knew I was getting close. Like I, you know, I I made it to like here before I got home from my trip, and um, I I just thought, ah, I'm so close, I'm so close, I'm so close, but no, <laughs> not so close, not so close. Um, only because there was a lot more to go. Um, I did, so I was going to say, if you've, if you've made this pattern, and I feel like everyone has made this pattern, um, you'll notice that I did some mods, and that is because, so I didn't do, there was, there should be some little stripy rows in here in this last section, little two rows of mohair. There, I think there were supposed to be three of them, or no, there were supposed to be five of them. I didn't do that because I ran out of mohair. <laughs> So I used every last bit of my mohair um, and I had, this is what I have left actually, I just ended it. When I got to the end of this um, second to last section here, that was all I had left. So I just cut it and just decided to finish the sweater off with, or shawl, shawl off with um, the wool that I had on hand. That little end is really bugging me. <laughs> Um, so I think it looks fine. I mean, no one would know. Only another knitter who knit the same pattern would have any idea that that was a modification that I made. Um, and I made it because out of, out of, uh, uh, because I had to, I was forced to, <laughs> I ran out of all the other. So there was just no way, um, I was going to be able to finish it. And I didn't want to introduce a third color. So um, let me tell you about the yarns. This gold, the wool, my wool is Ching Fiber. This is kind of a, a jacked label, but anyway, it's part of her, there you can see, it's King K, or Ching, or King, you could pronounce it too, Q-I-N-G, Fiber. Um, this is part of her Shangri-La collection. It is the colorway Ember. She's a really nice gold. Um, if you're a hedgehog fiber fiberist, <laughs> if you're into hedgehog fibers, it's similar to fool's gold. I think it has a little bit more layering going on in it than um, fool's gold does, but it's like gold with splashes of blue and rusty red um, in it throughout. And those blue, that blue hitting the gold sometimes creates green, which is cool, or turquoise. Um, my mohair is not the same company. It is uh, the company Ulan, O-L-A-N-N. Um, it is a Kid Silk mohair blend, typical 7228 uh, Kid Silk, Kid mohair and 28% silk. Um, and you can see I had enough for the pattern, supposedly. I don't know what changed. I it 450 meters, um, which should have given me close to 500 yards. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know what changed. I don't know if maybe I knit the mohair sections too loosely like that. That could be. I mean, what I did notice um, in the in the knitting of it is that, wait, that's probably not a good section to show, make this point. So there, you can see. So you do 10 ridges here and 15 ridges with the wool. And you can see that when it's blocked, those sections look pretty equal. So I don't think I messed up. Yeah, I, I followed the pattern. I made, I did make some mistakes. Like I really, uh, ha I had trouble understanding the lace in the first section. So it took me till the, um, almost the end of the first section to understand what it was we were trying to do with the lace or what we were meant to try to do with the lace. Um, so I don't, it's not exactly neat on the bottom section, but it's a shawl. So um, I'm unlikely to be wearing it completely open anyway. Um, it's more likely going to be wrapped around me in some way, shape, or form. So, um, but anyway, super happy with it. Glad it's done. Glad it's done. Um, I have been wearing it since it, I finished it just because, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's gorgeous and it's new and, who doesn't want new things? So I do have to weave that last end in though. That is, that will be important to take care of. Um, okay. I've also been working on the garment that um, Martha's wearing. 
I, uh, I didn't make as much progress on this as I thought. I actually thought I would, I guess I thought I would knit the shawl faster. And because I knit the shawl faster, I would be able to, um, I'd be further along on this. But I did make some progress. I have um, cast on the sleeve, one of the sleeves, and I don't know if you can see too well because I have her slightly off screen. Um, but yeah, so I've done, it's a very nice set in sleeve. Hang on, let me let me change the camera angle slightly. So you can see, oh, that didn't really do any good. I'll move her back, there we go. So you can see it's got a really nice sleeve cap. I'm really happy with it. I think you can see the detail right there too. It's come out really well. Um, so this is, I haven't really said what the pattern is. This is a pattern of my own design and it's really, I mean, I don't know. I kind of use the term design loosely. Like I get, yeah, I guess it's my own design. It's based on a, a pullover layering tee. I've gone over it like, sorry, sorry, returning viewers. You have heard about this ad nauseum. Um, so I'm going to not, I'm going to kind of skate over a lot of the details and I will do a complete like this is what it is and where I got the inspiration when it's finished which I hope will be by the next um, whole episode that I do not my little vlogmas um, which will start in a week um, but it's meant to be a Henley so it won't have this big gap right here this will actually have a button placket and there will be a uh, rib collar around the neck as well that will fill in a lot of this like what you're what you might be perceiving as open space because her her neck edge is right here which would be like right here on me um and also this is a this is a mistake rib stitch which when it is blocked it will open up so it won't be this it's right now it's, it's showing as if it has negative ease but it won't have negative ease it's going to have like a couple inches of positive ease actually once it's blocked and i think it'll also grow a bit um, again this is ching fiber um i had it for a while i was i was pretty um pretty happy buying a lot of ching fiber so i have i have a significant amount of it in my stash um Ching fiber. This is she calls this tweed sock. I do not think that you can get this regularly from her. Um, I feel like this was a small batch that she did. She died. 100% um, merino. Doesn't say whether it's superwash or not. I'm guessing it is superwash. Um, and yeah, that's about it. I'm alternating skeins, which is why you're seeing two strands here. Um, I actually am almost done with with one skein and I will be starting um, putting on a second one. But yeah, I, and oh, and the yellow, <laughs> the yellow is little gray sheep, um, the yellow tr uh, trimming that is actually from this, what I have left over from this. So this, I bought a mini pack from little gray sheep as well as um, some full skeins for the body. Um, and uh, yeah, I have plenty. I will be doing the yellow tipping around the placket and around the neck and also at the bottom of the sleeves. So I don't know why this isn't done. There's no good reason aside from that. I just let other things distract me. And uh, I mean, it's I'm in, I'm in easy breezy territory knitting along on that sleeve. Um, I think generally though, I tend to knit the first sleeve a little slowly and then the second sleeve goes faster because uh, I'm not questioning what I'm doing. So I, I guess it's a little slow because it is my own design. So I am spending time like dwelling on how many increases do I want on this sleeve and how narrow is it? And is it is when it's blocked, is it going to be narrow enough? But um, anyway, this pattern I probably will publish in the new year because I am planning to do two other versions. And I think I, I've decided I'm going to publish the pattern as a simple recipe and then you can and with variations so people will be able to choose which of the variations they want to do so i want to make it so that it's sort of a in a build your own way so that you can build your own version of this um so yeah that is the plan on that yeah so 
little bit of progress. Fin I have a finished object, though. I just have to keep telling myself that. I also spent some time spinning this weekend, which, or sorry, the, in the last couple weeks. But before I get into that, I have two new cast-ons that I want to share. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one too, too much because it's pretty straightforward and it's also not very big. But I cast on a new Breeze Racerback by Jessie Mead, which I'll pop in here. This is the third one that I've made. And this is part of my gift knitting. So you can see I've got about, I don't know, maybe four inches um, of body here. And um, I'm knitting on it very scrunched up. But this is like super mindless. It's just stocking at in the round for about 10 inches. Um, and yeah, so I'm in that mode, which is really nice. I love having a mindless knit that I don't have to think too much about, um, especially after doing the birds of a feather where you have to do something every row. Every row you're changing something. So you've got to pay attention. Um, it's hard to space out. Um, so it's nice to have something that now I can watch shows with subtitles again um, and get get a couple uh, shows done that I haven't been able to finish because I've been have, working on stuff that need, requires concentration. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to say too much about this other than it's just the Breeze Racerback and I will tell you what the yarn is. The This is a close-up of it. It's a beautiful charcoal gray, white with blue speckles and some amber gold speckles in there too. It's really, really pretty and I wish the camera would show it to you better. There, maybe there. <laughs> there, now you can see it. It's really pretty. Um, it is Stitch Together Studio, another indie dyer whose yarn, who's, who I have a lot of her yarn in my stash. Um, so Stitch Together Studio, this was part of a club collection. Um, she did a collection of, I think it was three months, she might have been a little bit more, oh yeah, it was six months, called The Cash Club. So it was colors inspired by Johnny Cash. And this one was color, uh, and this color is called Hurt. It was inspired by the song Hurt, which is one of my favorite Johnny Cash songs. So I had to have it. Um, it had a, they were sock sets actually. Um, so it had a, a little skein, a tiny little skein of gold, which uh, is going to be heels and toes on a future pair of socks, I swear. <laughs> I know I'm not a sock knitter, but I manage some sock swaps. So um, those, uh, those, yeah, I will share with you when they come in and I will talk with you more about the sock swaps um, that I have done when they come because they're fun. Okay, my second cast on also relates to some spinning that I've been doing. Guess what guys? I cast on the Achikochi, Achikochi. I cast on the Achikochi by Iri Shimizu. I cast it on. Um, I had showed you, I think I showed you the swatch last time, the swatch of gray with um, the two different reds. I don't have it here anymore. It's on my board over there. Um, but let me show you. I have been plugging away. So this, you know, I've realized like these, color work yoke sweaters like this one they're super addictive because you just want to keep going like it's like oh i have to do something different this next row let me see what that's going to look like so it's it's super addictive to just like continue 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 as you watch the um the color work grow and form so i'm actually almost done with the color work yoke so this is the neckline up here um, I have, I'm in the midst of a tiny section of, um, like another tiny section like this of color work. And then I have a big section, I think it's 12 rows or so, 10, 12 rows of, um, color work and then a little bit of texture work. And then it's it. I'm done with the yoke. Um, so I have a tendency to really shove myself through <laughs> the yoke. So, um, I was out at a friend's house over the weekend and we spend a lot of time, um, I spend a lot of time hanging around, sitting around while he cooks and cleans and does all sorts of fun, um, puts on really, picks very, very good. He's very good at picking 
awesome television shows. So he picked some really awesome TV that I got to sit and watch while um, I knitted. So I did get a lot of knitting done. I did a lot of that uh, race, Breeze Racerback, and I did a lot of this. And I brought this, but I didn't work on it. Um, but I will work on that this week. So yeah, this is my um, my second cast on, and I I talked about this last time. I t I had showed you a swatch of the great, beautiful this Shetland wool. Oh my goodness, beautiful, beautiful Scottish Shetland wool, Lama Mirror wool that I bought at EYF, grown with love in Scotland. It's a special four ply. Shetland wool blended with select Romney in a natural color. She calls it essay. Um, it's fingering weight, 100 grams, 400 meters or 437 yards. And yeah, it is so soft. Like, it, especially when it is um, the, my blocked swatch, just the wool blooms a little bit and it just feels so great. Like I, someone said, that Shetland is one of the softest wools and feeling this, I would completely believe that. Um, it is really, really nice. I love this, this like sheepy wool feel, it's so sweet. So um, what you might be noticing though is that the contrast color <laughs> is not one of the ones that I showed you. Um, I, after I had 100% decided that I was gonna use this um, fingering weight Targi wool that I had gotten, um, I don't know, a couple years ago, old stash, deep stash. Um, I, I don't know. I had this thought of like, you know, I really wanted to, I want, I was picturing the red in this sweater to be kind of a pink red marled situation. And so I started to think about that and, and I thought instead of going hunting for the yarn, I thought, well, you know what? I think I have a pink red <laughs> bat that needs spinning. So um, I went into my fiber stash and pulled out um, a bat that I had bought earlier this year, like in the summertime of this bright pink and red. When I talked about it goes, you will have remembered it if you watched any old episodes of mine. Don't don't go back if you haven't, it's okay. I'm gonna talk, show it to you here too. Um, but you will have remembered this bat from where I, the uh, episode titled, I Have a Red Problem. So I'm thinking about my next cast on that was going to be more complicated than a very simple, stockinette in the round type situation, I realized that making um, a sweater with a little bit of red and a little bit of sparkle would really help me get into the holiday spirit. So that is why I have, um, I chose this particular sweater to cast on. And I didn't, at the time that I had decided this would be my next cast on and not the stone crop pullover or, or cardigan, which I am planning to make, it's back over here. The one, the, the teal, the teal one with the dyed in the wool spin cycle. Um, that is going to be cast on too um, at some point, but I'm, I need to get a few things off the needle first. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to be waylaid by a lot of gift knitting in December. So I probably won't cast that on until towards the end of December, I think, but who knows? Who knows? Um, so anyway, I, I pulled out this bat and I I did some spinning and I have I have the majority of the skein here. It turned out underneath the bat, like when I when I opened the bat, it looks very red and pink. I put a picture in for you to see. It looked very red and pink, right? But when I opened it up, the bottom layer was black. So there's actually a lot of this black um, in there. I did not actively color manage it at all. I just uh, took the bat and ripped it in strips and just spun um, strip by strip, whatever I was getting. So I got a nice marled effect. And the, I think, I actually think I, I really like the black and I think I'm going to be really happy with the black in it, in this sweater. Cause this sweater, I'll show you the back picture. Um, this sweater, you take that color. So this one, she made it in gray and then this is black or charcoal or something. So you can see that, that there's color and cuffs and um, sorry, cuffs in the bottom are all made out of your contrast color. And 
I can't wait to get to that part because I think I'm going to love the way this knits up because um, I think I'm going to get a really nice like the pink to red marled of, um, impact of it. And there is a little bit, I think you can see it in there, a little bit of sparkle, little flecks of other colors in there too. Um, I think it's it just came out, I'm so, so pleased with the way it came out. It's just a simple two-ply. I actually haven't tried, I'm a new spinner, if you're, if you're a new to me viewer. I started to spin in May, like I learned how to spin from Alex Creates at a, in a class that I took with him um, in May. I, I learned how to drop spindle, and then from there, um, I quickly bought a spinning wheel and um, practiced and did some online classes. And just um, I'm told by people who have been spinning for a long time that I adapted really quickly and that I picked it up very very fast which doesn't didn't surprise me all that much like I was ha of course happy to hear who doesn't want to hear that <laughs> very happy to hear it um, but it, it didn't really surprise me because almost every fiber art that I've ever picked up I, I adapt I've adapted very quickly and I I don't know whether it's genetic or what but um, I have a grandmother who was really really I never met her she died before I was born um, but she was very very adept with all fiber arts like she quilted she made lace like she did she made a lot of lace um and she she knit and crocheted and a lot of stuff um all those fiber arts so i don't know if i i don't know i don't know don't i don't know where to attribute it to i'm the only one in the, my current family like my my living family that um is into fiber arts so it's hard to know Anyway, I digress. So yeah, this is my other cast on. I really, really love it. I'm loving the, the bright pink mixed with the red. Can you see it in there? See the red and pink together? I think they're just fantastic. Um, and I think like with, um, I had a, a little pink, um, what's the word? Like a section, a pretty long, like probably 50, so or so yard section that was pink 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 like pretty intense pink and then um but mostly and there are sections of that in here but mostly there's this just this what you're seeing on the outside like this this black um you know maybe a couple yards of black but there it's always almost always plied with another color whether it's the purple the red or the pink um so yeah that is uh my my latest cast on and some hand spun so there you go um the only other thing so this isn't going to be too long nice the only other thing that i worked on i spun another skein i don't have it anymore because as you if you watched last week or two weeks ago you'll know that i made an offer to my viewers to swap me sock knitting where i would provide the yarn <laughs> And I would give you a skein of hand spun. So I had two people take me up on it. So I, um, one person I had hand spun on hand that they, they loved. So I shipped that out to them with the yarn um, for the socks. And the second person I um, pulled a, I have like, I don't know, 80 single skeins of indie dyed, beautiful sock yarns. Most of them are sock yarns. Um, there's some that are not, that are 100% wool. Um, but fingering weight, a lot of fingering weight yarns. So I pulled out a skein that I really had been wanting to make into socks, but I just can't be motivated to make socks. Like I know if I put them on the needles, they'll stay on the needles for a year probably before I finish them. Um, I don't know what it is about me and socks. So anyway, I did a skein of, I spun a skein, I asked her what she liked, and I spun a skein of um, the fiber that is that was from my club collection, the Mabon Club, also Stitched Together Studio. I have a little piece, this was, um, I was trying to uh, make it very, very thin, so this was a piece that was a little too fragile for me to ply. It just wasn't holding its spin well. But just to give you an idea of what the what it spun up, this is just single ply. So it was sort of this like orangey, like very autumnal with these muted purple colors um, in it. And uh, also a little dab of sparkle and stuff. So um, I will have put in all the pictures of the fiber here and some of the fiber on the, on the um, spools and then the finished yarn. 
here because the person that I sent it to already received it and she fell in love with it, I, I think. She said she loved it, so I take that at face value. So um, I'm happy that she that she loved it and uh, it, it suited her. And uh, yeah, I hope to have, I, sh I know one pair of the socks are on the way to me already. Um, and I think a second pair will be on its way. So I should have at least two pairs of socks to show you um, in the next, in my next episode, which will be, you know, like mid-ish, no, first, maybe first week of December, first weekend of December. So yeah, and the only other spinning I've done, I did do, I've, I've been working uh, away on the Countess of Blaze Red, which will be another version of this sweater here. Um, I have one spool done. You can see the way it's, it, it um, spun up. Um, and I'm working away. This is what I have left for the second spool, so I should have more of this. Um, this spool here, I did not actively color manage. I let it just kind of, I let the blue and red blend in it, so that's what you see happens. But my second spool and also my first skein, I did actively color manage, where I pulled the blue. So you can see this is a primarily red section and where this is a primarily blue section. So I have pulled those apart. Um, I decided that I didn't really like what was happening with the blend and I, I much preferred when I was getting a little bit more barber pulling between the red and the blue. Um, so that was like a, I mean, a, I'm a work in process <laughs> with my spinning. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but I do really, really enjoy the color management aspect of it. I think it's super fun. Um, I, it's one of the things that just adds this dimension of interest to spinning for me. Like I just really like getting a complicated pack of colors and trying to figure out how, like what is it that I want? What's the outcome I want with this skein? And then what, um, yeah, what, what will I end up with? Like did, did what I picture end up in the skein? <laughs> so it's, I do really, really enjoy um, that aspect of spinning. It's so, so fun. Um, oh, I have one other purchase. I, I picked this up on a whim. Like it was really a whim. I'm not one who does a lot of, uh, impulse buying, but you know, when it, if it's a little like $10 thing, I'm, I, I can be, I am known to do that. Um, it's a pin that says, here you go. It's a pin that says, can't we all just knit along? Ah, come on, there we go. Can't we all just knit along? I thought it was cute. I don't remember if she had other colors, but I just thought that was, you know, I liked it. Um, yeah. I don't have anything else to talk with you about other than just, you know, upcoming, my watch for my Vlogmases, my first one, will be published um, probably December 2nd, because I'll do that record or, or yeah, like compile, record, do a, a vlog for the first and then it'll go up the next morning. Um, and then, so I'll be a day behind basically, like a day behind the actual day. So you'll see December 1st on December 2nd, the 2nd on the 3rd, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so hopefully you will enjoy and those look for those to be short, um, anywhere from five to maybe 15 minutes tops. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing that, sharing my, my Christmas month with you. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, and subscribe if you haven't already. I deeply appreciate you spending some time with me today and, um, happy crafting and knitting or whatever you happen to get up happy whiskey sipping <laughs> whatever you happen to get up to and happy thanksgiving for my american viewers um it's this thursday bye take care